hope everyone's okay with that. This session will be recorded for anybody that couldn't make it here today. And yes, so good morning, everyone. This is the first session of 2022. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, so today's session will be held by Dr. Sue Bergen. Dr. Sue Bergen is the head of the Council of Europe's Education Department and leads the current Council of Europe projects on competencies for democratic culture and the European qualifications passport for refugees. He has represented the Council of Europe in the Bologna follow-up group and the board since the year 2000 and chaired three successive working groups on structural reforms in 2017, 2007 to 15. Sier was a member of the editorial group for the Council's white paper on intercultural dialogue and main author of the Lisbon Recognition Convention, as well as of the recommendations on public responsibility for higher education, academic freedom and institutional autonomy, and ensuring quality education. Sier Bergen is the series editor of the Council of Europe Higher Higher Education Series and the author of Qualifications, Introduction to a Concept and Not by Bread Alone, as well as of numerous book chapters and articles on education and higher education policy. Sior is also one of the editors of the RAB Handbook on Leadership and Governance in Higher Education 2009-15, and one of se session coordinators at the Bologna Process Researchers Conference in 2015, 18, and 2020. He is the recipient of the 2019 European Association for International Education Award for Vision and Leadership. Welcome, Sir. Uh, the session is yours. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. Um, Happy New Year to everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, maybe even good evening to some of you. Um, we'll focus um, in this session on the fundamental values of higher education. Now, as you can see, I'm not of a generation that's the technological uh, native, um, or digital native. I would like to share uh, my screen, but I think you need them to give me the rights to do so. If I get a message saying that the animator has um, disactivated the share screen sharing. Um, I'm giving you the uh, rights now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> Okay, so let's go. So, um, as I said, um, the um, topic of this session, uh, which will take us till around four o'clock Central European time, um, is the fundamental values of, of higher education. Also, the fact that I'm sharing the screen now means that I probably will not be able to see very much of the conversation, uh, the chat or uh, a question, so I might need some help uh, with that. Um, it's, a, it's a longish session, so I thought it might be helpful to um, give an outline of what we're set to do this, this afternoon, our time. Um, I'll give you a brief background and context, uh, especially probably for those who do not come from Europe and maybe less familiar with the European higher education area. Um, then the first main part will be really to look at um, what we mean by fundamental values in the European higher education area. After that, I think we might need a, a short break. And then we'll go to issues and challenges, look at your role as student representatives, and look at some key text and initiatives, again, mostly in the European context. Um, that can be made longer or shorter as uh, we uh, go along. I would suggest I'd be happy to take question, um, questions um, at any point, especially questions for clarification and, and factual uh, questions. I would suggest that um, we have the discussion either under issues and challenges or at the very end. And I really hope we will have some discussion um, but I just think that if we start out already, when we go through the fundamental values, then we will, in fact, anticipate um, most of the issues and challenges. Okay, so let's go um, with the background and context. Um, the fundamental values of higher education are probably not specific to Europe or to the European higher education area. Nevertheless, I think what I might be able to um, present to you with is actually um a 
European view or a view from Europe. Um, so I'd be very interested in hearing during our discussion how those of you come from other parts of the world might relate uh, to those values and how you see them in your context. In Europe, um, the European, the higher education area um, has been underpinned by a set of fundamental values ever since it was launched. Um, but we tended to take those values for granted for a long time um, until I would say about 2015 or thereabouts, or uh, maybe a little bit before. Um, so unfortunately, um, I mean, on, on the one hand, it's good. We talk a lot more about uh, fundamental values than we used to do, but unfortunately for the wrong reasons, because the fundamental values are under considerably greater threat now in the European higher education area than they were um, two decades ago when um, the area was launched. I think it's also fair to say that the understanding that we have of our fundamental values has evolved somewhat, but not fundamentally over the past uh, two decades. So what is this thing that we're talking about, the European higher education area? It is really the main framework for higher education reform in Europe. Um, it was launched, now you'll see, I say it's launched in 1999 or in 1998, um, depends on who you ask. Most people would say it was launched in 1999. If you ask the French, they will say 1998. And in a sense, they're both right. 1998, because that was the first time that some European ministers responsible for higher education gathered um, to talk about higher education reform. They gathered um, at the Sorbonne at the 800th um, anniversary of the uh, Sorbonne, and um, they um, adopted the Sorbonne Declaration. Now, there were only four ministers present. France, obviously, as host, Germany, uh, Italy, and the UK. In other words, the four largest countries in the European Union. And there was some discontent among the other EU ministers saying, uh, this looks important, but we're not part of it and we want to be. Uh, and that led to quite some demand for um, a possibility to get into it. As it happened in Italy, um, the then minister uh, Berlinguer used, uh, wanted to carry out um, reforms of higher education in Italy and he thought he would it might be easier to do so if it could do that as a part of the European process. Um, so that's a, a good part of the background for the Bologna meeting in 1999. And um, of course, also um, then the Bologna declaration, which in a sense um, is the starting point for what we know as the Bologna process. Um, if you want to be very um, particular about it, I would argue that the Bologna process was launched in 1999, lasted until 2010, when it was transformed into the European higher education area. But don't worry too much about this uh, very particular distinction. Uh, we tend to mix up the Bologna process and the European higher education area all the time. There are two things here that I think might be of particular importance um, to this session. Um, the first is, of course, to say that there has been a quite strong evolution in the uh, European higher education area. It was uh, the Bologna Declaration was adopted uh, by the ministers of 29 countries. They were all either EU countries or had some, some connection to the EU framework through the participation and given um, European um, Union programs or were part of the European economic area. In 2003, that framework changed and the um, Bologna process uh, was open to all states party to the European Cultural Convention, which is the Council of Europe Convention from 1954, provided that the public authorities commit to what we come to see as the Bologna goals. In other words, the main principles and goals of the Bologna process. The, the immediate reason for this change is that Russia applied for membership. Um, that was not entirely uncontroversial, but it also became clear very quickly that one might have reservations about 
um, parts of your uh, Russian higher education policy, but you couldn't say that, the, that Russia, you can't join us because you're not European. That was simply not a viable um, position. And um, the European Cultural Convention was the framework that was uh, available. So now we have a cooperation involving 49 countries and Marino joined in 2020 as the latest. And uh, importantly, we have eight consultative members and that includes ESSER. Well, we actually have 50 members because there are 49 countries plus the European Commission. And then we have um, eight consultative members. They're mostly organizations, stakeholder organizations. So the European University Association um, Eurasia, which is the um, European Association for um, Professional Higher Education, but very importantly, also uh, the European Student Union uh, and uh, the Council of Europe and UNESCO also. To the extent that the European higher education area is known in Europe, it's probably mostly uh, for structural reforms, especially what has come to be called bachelor's, master's, doctorate, the three tier uh, qualifications framework. Um, that's one of three structural reforms, the other being the recognition of qualifications. The Lisbon Recognition Convention is the only legal text uh, in the Bologna process, and as well as quality assurance. The uh, European standards and guidelines uh, were adopted in 2005, reviewed in 2015, and um, there is an overarching framework of qualifications for the European higher education area. But there are other policy areas. ESSU has played a very important role in um, keeping the social dimension on the agenda and in um, also having adopted, developing and having adopted um, guidelines for the social dimension at the latest ministerial conference. Also the mobility. Um, there was concern that mobility in Europe is that it was only 10% of students studied abroad. And um, so there is a mobility strategy to global cooperation is important sustainable again again, and not least our topic today, uh, the fundamental values. So let's get on to the uh, fundamental values. Um, they have been defined uh, currently as <clears throat> institutional autonomy, academic freedom and integrity, the participation of students and staff in higher education governance and the public responsibility for and of higher education. In fact, I said at the outset that the, um, our understanding of the fundamental values had evolved somewhat. And I think the new elements on the one hand are that um, academic integrity has been added to the part in academic freedom. So it's both the academic freedom and the academic integrity. And um, the other part is um, an emphasis uh, not only on the public responsibility for higher education, but also the responsibility of higher education. So let's uh, have a look uh, in somewhat more detail about what these values um, actually are. And the starting point uh, could be the uh, universe, institutional autonomy, university autonomy. Also, obviously, it's a fundamental uh, value, but also because the Magna Carta Universitatum, which was adopted by European rectors, uh, actually not only European rectors, it's a global, uh, it's a global text in uh, 1988. Um, it is in a sense about both institutional autonomy and academic freedom, but the emphasis is very much on um, academic on institutional autonomy. It's understanding of um, of the autonomy. Autonomy is a little bit longer than you can reasonably put on the slide and still have it readable. So this is the short version. I'll read you out the full version, which is um, the university is an autonomous institution at the heart of society, differently organized because of geography and historical heritage. It produces, examines, appraises, and has down culture by research and teaching. To meet the needs of the world around it, its research and teaching must be morally and intellectually independent of all political authority and economic 
power. So there's quite a lot in here. Um, it does recognize that there are differences between countries, uh, partly geographical, <clears throat> but also because uh, of its historical heritage. And of course, the historical heritage um, also has to do with um, the political history and the different political systems. So the Magna Carta um, doesn't say that you have to be a full-fledged democracy for uh, institutional autonomy to be um, important or be a reality. And that's perhaps an, a point that we can discuss um, during this session. Um, and it also uh, emphasizes a cultural dimension. And it also emphasizes um, what later, um, as you saw in the overview, um, became um, known as the public responsibility of higher education. Higher education doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's very much part, part of society. So that's the Magna Carta understanding. If you try to break it down a little bit, um, you may, uh, of course, say that um, institutional autonomy is really about the ability and perhaps also the will of higher education institutions <clears throat> to set their own priorities in teaching, learning, and research. That's, of course, a, a shorthand, um, but I think it's, uh, it gives a uh, useful starting point. Now, in Europe, we tend to think, talk about institutional autonomy <coughs> and academic freedom um, in the same breath. Um, and I think very often, um, Europeans tend not to think a lot about what the difference between the two would be. So there's obviously a link between them, but um, there is the, um, they're not one and the same. Institutional autonomy, as the term says, is very much about uh, the institutional level. How do institutions act, how free are institutions to act, um, how um, it's also about the uh, leeway that the institutional leaders then have to uh, have in, in leading their institutions, uh, of course, in uh, cooperation with the academic community of staff and students. Academic freedom, on the other hand, is very much about the freedom of the individual member of the institutional economy. So institutional autonomy is, is, is more a collective of freedom. Uh, academic freedom is more of an individual freedom. There is, of course, um, and the, the um, institutions do not exist in a vacuum. And especially in Europe, uh, I think in, in, in many other parts of the world, less so in North America, or at least in the US, um, public authorities also play an important role. Um, if, again, if you want to use shorthand, uh, public authorities are responsible for the education system, whereas um, institutions are responsible for their own activities, their own teaching and learning. Now, theoretically, this sounds very straightforward, in reality, of course, there are lots of gray zones. And um, if uh, the relationship were straightforward, we would have probably have <clears throat> a lot less discussion about uh, what that relationship actually means and the number of contexts. And we'll come back to that when we get to the um, when we get to the uh, issues and challenges part. Um, there is, of course, a link between institutional autonomy and your model of society. I would find it very difficult to imagine complete institutional autonomy in not democratic. Um, so I think one important uh, discussion could be uh, to what extent do our fundamental values, in particular institutional autonomy and academic freedom, actually depend on our models of society. Can you have them in a society that's not uh, fully democratic? Or maybe the question should rather be, to what extent can you then have them? Now I seem to be stuck. Um, I, I 
I'm trying to move the, ah, here we go. Okay. Um, sorry, my screen is stuck for a while. So um, academic freedom, as I said, is, is very much uh, about the um, position of individual members of the academic community. And the um, Bologna process said early on that <coughs> students are uh, uh, an integral part of the academic community. Um, this is actually the only fundamental value which there is a formal definition in the Bologna process. And the reason for that is that it was the least explored of the uh, fundamental values. So in 2020, um, in what's known as the Rome communique, ministers um, accepted the definition of academic freedom as the freedom of academic staff and students to engage in research, teaching, learning, and communication in and with society without interference, nor fear of, a, of appraisal. Um, this is, of course, uh, a short, but nevertheless uh, quite, ex quite expansive definition of academic freedom. It does um, talk about individuals. It talk, does talk about their relationship to society, and it specifies um, that they should not fear repraise, reprisal or, or interference. So as we see, it's a distinct from institutional autonomy, but there is also often <coughs> um, confusion between academic freedom and the freedom of thought and the freedom of expression. There's a lot in common between them. And nevertheless, um, they're not one and the same. If you talk about um, academic freedom, of course, it applies to um, members of the academic community. Uh, but they're not free um, to say anything they please. They um, need to base uh, their statements on um, the academic key and the, the standards of the discipline. So if you take a very obvious example, um, if you're a professor of literature and you maintain the earth is flat, um, that would probably be taken as an eccentric opinion but it wouldn't impact on your status as an academic because um, astrophysics is, is really not part of your uh, academic field. But if you're an astrophysicist and you uh, maintain that the earth is flat, uh, then you really have a problem in relation to uh, your academic competence in your own field because obviously um, the vast majority of astrophysics I would have no doubt as to um, the falsity of that particular statement. Um, the, now that's a very obvious example. Um, and you may say perhaps that academic freedom is the freedom of thought and expression tempered by the standards of the discipline. But as we shall see in the next slide, that's also not meant, to, I, I think there's certainly a core of truth in that statement but it's not entirely unproblematic. I would like to um, mention one example, which is horrendous uh, to most people, uh, but can nevertheless uh, perhaps illustrate some of the relationship between uh, academic freedom and the freedom of expression. In the 1980s, uh, early 1990s, there was a researcher historian uh, at the University of Lyon in France, uh, by the name of Robert Forisson, um, who was a Holocaust denier. Uh, so he uh, published uh, books and articles and also um, made oral presentations in which he maintained um, that essentially the Holocaust was fake news. Um, that, of course, led to a very uh, justified uproar. Um, it also went against French legislation and which Holocaust denial is unlawful. And he was eventually dismissed from his uni university position. But he was dismissed not because he had violated the French legislation on the Holocaust, but because as a historian, he um, clearly demonstrated his incompetence in his academic discipline and that the reality of the Holocaust is not in doubt. So um, it is an example 
of uh, an outrageous uh, statement that goes against um, certainly historical facts. Um, also, get, in this case, goes against uh, French legislation. Uh, but in the end, it was the competence in the core academic discipline rather than um, these other concerns that uh, made him um, lose his, his position. As, as we saw, um, the academic freedom uh, and academic integrity are listed together. They're actually, to me, quite different things. There is, of course, um, when you talk about academic freedom, um, academic integrity is one of the things that you should observe as a researcher and as a student. Um, but it's not one and the same thing. Um, the academic, academic integrity is really the ability, but also the will to conduct research, teaching and learning honestly. There is a positive, uh, that, that's a part of the positive definition. There is, of course, also uh, a negative definition. But if you want to stay on the positive side for a bit longer, so what as a student and as an academic um, you're expected to do is to uphold the moral and ethical principles in and through higher education research and higher education as such should develop a culture of integrity in the same way that I would maintain it should develop a culture of democracy, a culture of engaging with public space. Um, there is, of course, also a negative uh, side to this definition. And if you look at the news, um, the um, negative side of the definition is what is normally uh, hits the headlines. So uh, you should refrain from falsification. You should refrain from plagiarism. And you should, of course, refrain from corruption. Um, all, th there are examples. Of, I was almost going to say there are good examples, but let's rather say there are bad examples of all of these uh, the falsification of research results. Um, it's unfortunately not an uncommon phenomenon. Uh, my roots lie in Norway, and um, I remember a case from the 1980s where um, a researcher had published a quite prominent article um, on cancer, on cancer treatment, and it was it raised quite a bit of interest until somebody sat down and looked at the footnotes, um, and he claimed that um, he had gotten most of his information from uh, a, a cancer register. The only problem was that the cancer register has actually been established after um, he had claimed he had done his research. And then, of course, it all fell apart, and it was very clear that he had constructed all his, his data. So a very clear um, case of um, falsification of data. Um, also, this is a natural science or medical research article, um, and there were lots of co-authors. So it also, this particular case raised a lot of questions about the role of co-authors. It was very clear that some of the co-authors, at least, um, had been recruited to lend credibility to the article uh, and had not really uh, put any uh, in any uh, research into the article or, or may not even have read it. Plagiarism, of course, is, as we know, copying a uh, large part of your work from others. It has been quite prominent in uh, Europe over the past decade or two, including um, in several countries, not least Germany, um, several ministers being challenged on their um, doctoral thesis. And uh, in some cases, um, the doctoral titles, the doctoral degrees have been withdrawn, um, perhaps Germany, because the premium on having a doctoral title um, in Germany is quite high. And um, for public figures, it's, if not a must, at least a, a very clear advantage. There's also a case in Serbia now where um, a minister is accused of plagiarism and, and you will find this. Um, it's actually more frequent than you would like. You would like uh, corruption. We basically know what it is. Uh, it's uh, essentially private payment for um, public uh, performance, public service. Uh, 
but corruption is, of course, not only cash payments. It's really any kind of favor. So I do you a favor and you do me a favor. If I give you, <coughs> if I'm lenient on your exam, uh, my daughter uh, will get into the uh, kindergarten of which you're the um, manager. Um, and it's, uh, it's very difficult to have an overview of what corruption, I mean, what corruption is, we know quite a lot about, but how extensive it is. I think it's important to underline that corruption is a phenomenon in all countries, a potential phenomenon in all countries, and all countries need to be vigilant. Um, one of the more innovative anti-corruption measures I've heard about was at a university in Southeast Europe, where um, there was a requirement that all books be sold through the university bookstore. Now, it seems like a quite unimportant measure, but of course it meant that teachers could no longer sell their books in class, keep lists of the students who bought and the students who did not, and you can, and you can guess then who had the best chance of passing the exam. And academic integrity is also what we talked about in the previous slide, namely abiding by the standards of the discipline. Now that rate does raise some questions. On the one hand, it's clear that the standards of the discipline have been developed um, as a cumulative experience. It is an important point, but it does raise the question of how do you then develop the standards of the discipline often? This is done by consensus uh, through a process involving uh, the researchers in the field. But there is the occasional uh, quantum leap where um, the <clears throat> standards are actually revolutionized. And um, at first, that may not be um, consensual. Think of uh, the famous case of Dr. Semmelweis, um, a Hungarian, well, actually an Austro-Hungarian, but a, a Hungarian. Uh, a medical doctor in the 19th century who uh, made a revolutionary discovery at that time that if doctors actually washed their hands uh, in between operations, the chances of survival increased uh, dramatically. And at the time, the example he used is they went from the morgue to the delivery room. And he was actually ostracized by the medical community uh, for insisting uh, on this. So there is um, there is a question, uh, which I think it, to which there is no uh, obvious answer, but how you actually abide by the standards of the discipline, um, or how you how you develop the standards of the discipline. Said most of the time, probably by consensus and a sort of cumulative experience. Uh, but what do we do with the uh, real challenges to the standards? Uh, sometimes they're justified, sometimes they're not. The um, European higher education area has, from an early stage, emphasized the needs for students and staff to participate in higher education governance. And, uh, this is perhaps uh, something that might distinguish uh, the European higher education area from some other. I said that there is an amount of background noise. Can you please turn out your, turn, cut your microphone? So um, there, this is a requirement. It's something that uh, countries that want to join the uh, European higher education area have to uh, have to commit to. And again, it, it obviously raises a number of issues. Um, the, the minimum requirement is that students and staff would be represented in all higher education governance bodies. It does uh, distinguish, for example, the um, European higher education area from the situation in the US, where there is a um, lot less internal representation on governance bodies, although uh, US universities are probably better than European universities at um, seeing themselves as actors in broader society. But on the internal governance, this may well be a European um, specificity. And you'll see, for, say, from other continents whether that's true or not. Um, Student representation and staff representation can, of course, be at different levels. Um, you have the department, you have the faculty, you have the institution, then you have system representation, 
and in our case, also the European higher education area. Um, representation at the institutional faculty level <clears throat> is very well uh, established in Europe. Uh, you will not find, I think, any country uh, where there is no such representation at faculty institutional level. Department level in principle is the same, but sometimes it's more difficult to find um, students who actually, what is at least the smaller departments who, who want to engage. Um, and the smaller departments, of course, the, um, the staff uh, tend to be there almost all the time. At system level, there are other issues that are raised because if you talk about the education system, of course, you talk really about the responsibility of the Ministry of Education, but also ultimately about um, the Parliament, um, who are responsible for the system. So there is no, um, say, a system council in the same way that you would have a, a university senate or a faculty senate. Uh, but there are ways of consulting uh, both the institutions and the um, student and staff unions, uh, and this should definitely be done. In the European higher education area, the uh, EHGA is governed by the Bologna follow-up group, um, where the willing members are the countries in the European Commission, but where ESSU and also Education International um, are, uh, are consultative members and uh, very often weigh in. Um, so same, but of course, saying that the students should be there is not quite enough. Um, they also be, need to be identified through um, fair and free elections. And we've had some discussions in the European higher education area about this. In most countries, um, this is the case, but um, there are countries, uh, Belarus comes to mind, in which um, some student organizations are recognized by the authorities and some are not. And obviously, the ones that are more critical of the authorities are the ones that find it difficult to be recognized. So um, there is, I think, a requirement that the representative, all students and all staff should be able to run for election, have a fair chance of, of presenting their views and, and, and being elected. Um, also, once elected, I think it's fair to say that um, there's no issue before the governing body on which student and staff representatives should not be able to speak and vote. And I think now we've probably come to a point where in most countries this is not an issue. Uh, I was um, a student representative once, uh, a bit longer than, ago than I care to remember, but in the, 1980, or in the early 1980s when I was a member of the University Senate at the University of Oslo, um, we did have uh, student representatives a voice uh, and a vote on all matters, but there were some who felt that students really shouldn't, for example, vote when it comes to uh, adopting the university budget. They should their uh, activity should more be restricted to um, issues that had to do directly with teaching and learning. Um, fortunately, uh, that discussion never really got off the ground. It was not really challenged, but it's interesting to note, nevertheless, that there was some kind of discussion around this. And then, of course, you can ask um, how many students should there be? How many staff representatives should there be? Um, here again, I think uh, the um, representation varies quite a bit, and you'll tell me what the case is in your respective uh, situated context. Um, in Europe, I think you will not find any system where it's less than 10% of students on the um, governing bodies, and you probably quite have to look quite hard to find systems where it's significantly more than 25 or 30%. Um, there is a quite interesting development in Europe um, in the terms of governing models, where the traditional European governing model is that um, the rector, the dean, um, is elected by either the governing body or by an a broader assembly made up of staff, uh, students, and also technical administrative staff. Um, 
and where uh, the governing bodies are essentially made up also of um, faculty, in other words, uh, scientific staff, academic staff, uh, um, students, and technical administrative staff. Incidentally, the most common model is that in these cases, the um, academic staff have a majority uh, and there is a stronger representation of students than there is uh, of technical and administrative staff. Now, the reason the ideology behind this is that the um, academic staff are seen as the ones that have the strongest competence in the core uh, mission of higher education. In other words, uh, research, teaching, and learning, to some extent also what they call the third mission. And the students have a stronger competence in uh, these missions and perhaps also a stronger stake in them than the technical administrative staff. The development that we've seen in many parts of Europe is a development toward a, a stronger external representation in the governing bodies and b um, the hiring rather than election of institutional leaders who then often come from outside of the institution <coughs> and uh, in some cases also from outside of academia. This uh, transition has uh, strangely enough not caused a great deal of discussion. Strangely enough, because um, it is really a quite fundamental shift in the ideology behind it. It's really a quite fundamental shift in the view of what you see as the main competences required <clears throat> to govern a higher education institution. It is a shift away from an emphasis on competence in the core missions of higher education, research, teaching, and learning, toward, if you want, the more broad societal competence. In other words, a competence in the role of higher education in broader society. Um, that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. It's not necessarily a good thing either. And, and I mean, the, it would be legitimate, I think, to have a broad discussion about what kind of competence you really need to govern a higher education institution. My problem with the development is that, at least in Europe, we really haven't had that discussion. So there has been a shift um, without a real discussion of what is behind it. Um, and you also have cases in Europe, certainly in my own in my home country, where you have seen institution rectors moving between institutions, first a period as rector at one institution and moving to a completely different institution. That is, of course, not unknown in the US, where university press, being a university president is almost like a profession in itself. And it does uh, emphasize uh, what is seen as a need for professional leadership. Um, but it, there hasn't been a very strong discussion about what kind of professional leadership would be required in higher education? Is that a sort of general management competence, of which I would personally be quite skeptical? Or is it a combination of um, management competence and um, a, a real understanding of the particularities of higher education? I think and I hope there would be uh, agreement that um, a university cannot be run according to the same standards as, say, a commercial corporation, um, but we really haven't had that much of a discussion around that. So let's move now to the final, um, the final um, fundamental value that we have listed in the European higher education area, which is the public responsibility for and of higher education. Um, The origin lies with two communiques within the uh, European higher education area. And, and the communiques in the European higher education area are really the statements by, that govern the, uh, the Bologna process, the European higher education area. The, uh, 
these are adopted by the ministerial conferences, which in the early years were held every two years. Now it's more like every three or four years. Um, and they are the basis on which the um, European higher education areas then developed in the next work period. In Prague in 2001, so very soon after the Berliner process was launched, and again in Berlin in 2003, ministers said that higher education is a public good and a public responsibility. If they said that twice, were they stating the obvious? Or were they actually expressing a kind of concern that what had been seen as key elements of the European of European higher education area were not no longer could no longer be taken for granted. I mean, my take is um, that um, it was the latter, and my take is also that of the two elements here, the public good and the public responsibility, the most operational uh, point is the one about public responsibility. Um, higher education is in few contexts an entirely public good or entirely private good. Um, exactly where on the scale between the public good and the, and, and the private good it should be located is an interesting academic discussion. But the most operational part of the um, statement is nevertheless that uh, higher education is a public responsibility. Um, there would be quite different interpretations in Europe and in the US, for example, of this, uh, for the simple reason that um, the uh, European tradition is very much uh, that of public financing and also of uh, public authorities being responsible for the um, education system. Um, in the US, um, the role of public authorities and especially the federal public authorities, but I think also the state authorities is considerably uh, less. We have, uh, from the Council of Europe side, we took this statement as a, starting, as a starting point for developing work on trying to define the responsibility of um, public authorities for higher education. And in 2007, uh, we um, adopted um, a recommendation on that, uh, which I'll refer to in the, in the overview of text and initiatives. What essentially we said there is that um, there is an exclusive public responsibility for the education system. And that means that, um, but th there is also a, a key public responsibility uh, for ensuring equal opportunities. And there is um, an important but not exclusive uh, public responsibility for financing higher education for and for uh, the actual provision of higher education. That of course reflects the situation in Europe where um, higher education is largely public, but where there is also room for private institutions. It does mean though that the private institutions operate within a framework established by public authorities. So if you want to be a part of the education system, say of Germany, you have to operate within the framework established by the German authorities. Now, perhaps that was not the best example because we know Germany as a, as a federal system and, and there might be some competence divided between the federal and the lender level, but say, um, if you're a Swedish institution, you operate entirely within the framework established by the Swedish uh, public authorities. Um, it does mean uh, that uh, you give your degrees in accordance with the Swedish um, qualifications framework. You uh, are subject to um, the Swedish regulations on quality assurance, and certainly quality assurance is a public responsibility. It doesn't mean that the ministries actually do the um, quality assurance. It does mean that the ministries as the public authorities responsible for higher education are responsible for making sure that there is provision for um, quality assurance in higher education. And it does mean that no institution can um, say they're not interested in quality assurance, they'd rather not do it and still be a part of the system. But of course, the ministry delegates the operational uh, responsibility for quality assurance uh, 
uh, to an agency and that agency may change over time. Um, in Europe, at least, um, a ministry doing uh, the operational part of quality assurance would not be considered as um, being sufficiently independent to abide with the European standards and guidelines. And at least it does mean that while um, there may be private financing of higher education, that financing has to be carried out within the framework established by published public authorities. Uh, it also means that uh, universities uh, are free to decide um, which, which students to accept, um, which uh, uh, staff to hire, etc. But they have to do so um, fairly and uh, respect public rules and non-discrimination. So they cannot say we don't want staff or students from a particular part of the country or from a particular um, ethnic group, for example. So that's the public responsibility for higher education. And it's really about the responsibility, the, our collective responsibility for higher education, the responsibility of, of public authorities. And the other part, of course, is what responsibility does higher education then have toward broader society? When we talk about institutional autonomy, when we talk about uh, academic freedom, these are not absolute. Uh, higher education does not exist in a vacuum. And higher education, of course, uh, does need to absorb, to observe the general legislation also of the country. So when you talk about the responsibility of higher education, of, of higher education, it's really uh, our responsibility toward broader society. Higher education is an actor in society. <clears throat> it should uh, engage with society <clears throat> and very many academics and institutions do so, of course, to try to make society better. Um, in the Council of Europe, we have defined uh, what we have come to call the democratic mission of higher education. And it may be of interest to note that um, we have a cl very close cooperation with uh, a group of NGOs, higher education NGOs in the US, as well as with the um, International Association of Universities and um, the Organization of American States in this. Um, and what you see in this case is that um, Europeans probably have a better developed internal democracy at institutions, whereas many US institutions are uh, more aware of their roles as actors in broader society. As, as a, an example, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, which is one of our main cooperation partners, um, their main campus is located in a, a very disadvantaged part of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and sometimes in the 1980s, they stopped and said, listen, we cannot continue uh, acting the way we do um, because little of what we do actually benefits our immediate surroundings. So they developed a very strong um, program of community engagement. Um, and we see also a number of European uh, universities um, doing the same. Uh, Queen's University of Belfast will certainly be, uh, and, um, uh, be an um, example of this. So um, this is um, a summary of our recommendation that I mentioned. So we have uh, public authorities have exclusive responsibility, the framework leading responsibility for ensuring equal opportunities, and then the substantial responsibility for financing higher education and research. Now, I've been going on for close to an hour. Um, I think maybe this could be a good point, point at which to take a break um, because um, we, the next part um, will deal with the, some of the issues and challenges. And that's where I really also hope that you will be able to um, engage in discussion. So if it's okay, and um, if there are any questions for clarification at this point, I will be happy to take them. Uh, but otherwise, I suggest that we could have a break of, could I suggest uh, 15 minutes? My watch is now at 2.30 Central European time. So if we, if we really make sure that we're back by uh, 2.45, would that be okay? <clears throat> 
Wolf can drop a thumbs up if that's okay. I so said, I can't, I, since I, I showed the PowerPoint, I can't really see a chat or anything else. Are there any questions in the chat that needs to be addressed before we break? Uh, no questions in chat right now. All right. Uh, seeing as there are none. Uh, okay, so uh, let's uh, breathe for uh, about 15 minutes and really be back in session by a quarter to three, if that's okay. Fantastic. All okay, right. thanks. See ya. See you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you had a chance to stretch and drink uh, a bit. Um, what I tried to do in the first part is really to give you um, some of the background, at least for the discussion as we see it in Europe. What I like to do in the second part is really three things. First of all, and that's the main part, look at some of the issues and challenges. And here, um, I will probably spend some time doing it, but nevertheless, when, when I'm through that, I'd suggest that we do have uh, a discussion because um, this is probably where um, the experience from different parts of the world that really come in handy. Um, then uh, uh, look a little bit about the role of student representatives, and I'm sure you will have lots of views on that. And then for about 10 minutes or so toward the end, I'd simply like to go through some of the main text and initiatives, again, mostly from a European perspective. Um, we're supposed to end up um, at four uh, Central European time, um, and we'll try to do that. I'm prepared to go a little over if needed, but of course you also have many things, uh, many commitments. So uh, when you look at um, issues and challenges, um, uh -huh, and it would be even better if, okay. Um, I've been inspired by Robert Quinn from Scholars at Risk to look at these and the three of the issues that and the three different headings. It talks about definition. What do we mean by an issue? data, what do we actually know about um, how this issue is uh, implemented, and really look at the at the implementation of such. Now, of course, we talked a lot about the definition understanding in the first part, so I'm not going to dwell a, a lot on this. But from our perspective, there are two main reasons why fundamental value, the fundamental values of higher education are essential. The first has to do with democracy. You cannot conceive of a democratic society in which there is no respect for the fundamental values of higher education. You can also perhaps uh, discuss whether the fundamental values of higher education can be adequately respected in non-democratic societies. And that I think is, is an issue on which I'd like to hear your views. But the other reason for um, fundamental values is also that they're seen to improve the quality of learning, teaching, and research. Um, if you cannot question uh, received truths, if you cannot question assumptions, you also cannot advance knowledge. Um, so it's difficult to see quality or high quality research, teaching, and learning, um, unless you have academic freedom, unless you have uh, institutional autonomy, unless you respect uh, academic integrity. But I would also say, unless you have the relationship to society that follows from um, the participation of students and staff in governance, and also the public responsibility for and of higher education. Um, there has been, in Europe at least, quite a lot of attention to violations of fundamental values, especially institutional autonomy and academic freedom. These are the kind of high-profile cases. In other words, where there are clear, it's, there's a clear link to political conditions, um, but 
and and so for example a case like the central european university which uh, was targeted by hungarian legislation um, has been a, a quite high profile case those high profile cases are perhaps not universal they are they they occur more in some countries than in others but all countries have issues of the low profile aspect of institutional autonomy because it's not a question of either or it's really very often a question of, of a reasonable balance and they may um, be subsumed under the question about what is the right relationship between public authorities and institutions we all i think would tend to agree that both have uh, an important uh, role to play both the public authorities and the academic community but what exactly is the right relationship just to take an example uh, at least in Europe, I think there would be agreement that public authorities have a right and a duty uh, to make sure that there is adequate higher education provision also in <clears throat> areas of the country that are less uh, densely populated. There's also a broad agreement that um, the actual provision of higher education research is for the institution. But there is, of course, a, a lot, uh, there's a considerable gray zone in between these two very clear um, principles and where actually, what exactly um, is that? Um, and uh, in Europe, I think there has been also a clear tendency to think of especially institutional autonomy, but perhaps also um, academic freedom is largely an issue of what the legislation says. Um, and that is, of course, important. You cannot have uh, the fundamental values if the, your legislation outlaws them. Um, but legislation has to be implemented. And there are lots of uh, issues around that. And part of that is funding models, part of it is governance models. Uh, part of it is also the relationship between um, the uh, higher education and general legislation, for example, labor legislation, how does um, provisions on working time, um, imp uh, impact on higher education. On the one hand, academic staff have the same right to labor protection, to uh, regulating working hours as, as anybody else, any other employee. Uh, but on the other hand, we also know that in certain situations, such as uh, experience that run, for example, or when you're writing an article or engage in a, in a research project, um, a 35 or 40 hour a week may not necessarily be uh, what you would actually want to have. So there are quite a few um, issues around this that might be important to um, look at. Related to this, the data, um, what do we actually know about the state of um, fundamental values? In the European higher education area, we have a series of reports called the uh, implementation reports, essentially um, prior to any ministerial conference in the European higher education area, uh, Eurydice, uh, which is uh, an agency within the um, European Union, publishes an implementation report, but are not alone in doing it. They have a reference group, a working group. Um, uh, in which both EU and non-EU countries are represented as oversees that. Um, so we know something about it, but um, there are nevertheless quite a uh, number of questions. Perhaps the main question is who actually provides the data that the report relies on? The European higher education area is an intergovernmental project, uh, process, so it's <coughs> perhaps natural that um, it relies on official data uh, provided by the countries concerned. Um, that is good, and, and some of these uh, data can only be received from um, official sources, but when it comes to fundamental values, um, there is perhaps a particular issue in that um, it is considerably more difficult for a country or a minister to admit that we don't quite abide by the fundamental values than to say there are things, there are imperfections in our qualifications framework or our quality assurance system. So it is important also to have source uh, information from other sources, and we have in the Bologna process um, 
two main sources. One is provided by the um, European University Association representing the institutions. They're called the Trends Reports. Uh, but also the ESSA, the European Student Union, <coughs> has provided um, a series of reports called Bologna with Student Eyes. And uh, while um, the information um, to some extent coincides, as you would expect, uh, there is not always agreement on the state of implementation. And certainly if there are major issues with the fundamental values that this agreement would be blatant. Um, we may also need to look at um, information from specialized bodies. Uh, the Scholarships Risk is a global organization, um, NGO, also has a European branch, very well respected, and it's concerned with academic freedom, in particular protecting uh, the, uh, the academic freedom of scholars, um, to some extent also students, and, and uh, does quite a lot to help scholars that have had to leave their own country. Um, there are also national bodies. Uh, the one that comes to mind is the Independent Bologna Committee in Belarus. Um, and it is, of course, a politically difficult question um, to decide what weight one should give to um, data provided by non-official sources. Um, and um, ultimately, that's a political decision by ministers. What we do in the Bologna follow-up group is at least to argue that one needs to look at um, also alternative sources of information. If you look at the uh, latest implementation report, which is that from 2018, the 2020 ministerial conference was a bit uh, unusual, um, and there's only two years from 2018 to 20, so there was no time to uh, prepare a complete implementation report. Now, the report runs to some 330 pages, and only five or six uh, developed, uh, devoted to values and governance. I think that reflects also the um, difficulty of actually assessing or measuring by anything close to objective criteria what um, the state of implementation values is. So if you look at the, that, those five or six pages, they focus on the previous ministerial communique. Uh, they uh, focus on the legal aspects of academic freedom, institution autonomy, uh, the legal basis for academic freedom, how the uh, governing bodies are composed. And that's of course important because that would show you to what extent staff and students are represented there. Um, they're, um, they focus on regulations for appointing and dismissing um, institutional leaders. Is it the ministry? Is it the institution itself, uh, etc.? And uh, it, it focuses on who decides when new uh, study programs are uh, established, uh, and also um, on uh, what kind of consultations you have at, <coughs> at uh, system levels. But there are lots of things that at, at present we are not very well equipped to measure. Um, there is very explicit criticism in the uh, implementation report of three countries, Turkey, Russia, Hungary, Turkey, because of um, the crackdown on the academic community as part of the more general crackdown after the failed uh, coup in 2016, Russia, uh, because of issues with specific institutions in Hungary, of course, at the time, in particular, the Central European University since then, also the Academy of Science and the more general outlawing of gender studies as an academic discipline. But that, that of course, doesn't mean that there are only three countries um, in Europe that have issues with the fundamental values. Rather to the contrary, um, I think what we can see is that the degree to which fundamental values are implemented and respected is quite intimately linked to political systems. And what we in the Council of Europe and elsewhere have come to call the backsliding of democracy. Part of that is uh, what has, I think as an oxymoron, been called uh, backs um, illiberal democracy, which some European leaders um, 
tend to promote. Um, I think to me, uh, these are contradictory terms. You cannot be a liberal and a Democrat at the same time. Um, part of it, it has to do also with um, attitudes in broader society where we see uh, the rise of populism, mostly on the right, to some extent on the left. Uh, also, um, with a questioning of the need to base societal um, decision on facts, which of course questions the um, questions the need for research knowledge for academic uh, knowledge. Um, you see it in a in decreasing willingness in many European countries to accept migrants and refugees. Um, where the discussion really gets quite ugly. Uh, and of course, ultimately, um, if you don't like, if you don't accept that foreigners can have a place in your society, how can you do that in the same time um, see uh, academic mobility as a positive thing? So I think really there are uh, quite a few issues that we need to look at uh, in the, in the um, decades that comes. Um, I've said elsewhere that um, the European higher education area needs a fundamental values decade. And I think this is a part of the reason. The, um, of course, we need to look at the role of public authority in civil society, as we saw. And we need really to look at how we can actually encourage the implementation of our fundamental values. Um, the European higher education area had a better and painful discussion between 2015 and 2018 about how we deal with uh, non-implementation, non in other words. Uh, I think there's not a single country in the European higher education area that has implemented every commitment. Um, not all countries have a functioning qualifications framework, not all have a fully functioning quality assurance systems, and not all of them um, fully implement the Lisbon Recognition Convention. When I mention these three examples, it is because the outcome of that discussion has largely focused on structural reform. So uh, the out there was a, a discussion between uh, those who felt that um, peer learning was sufficient and those who felt that peer learning is important but that you nevertheless need to have some other measures to deal with um, countries or systems that, that really show little progress or little will to um, develop. Um, and the outcome is a system of um, peer learning that is applied to these three fundamental, uh, to these three uh, areas of structural reform. Um, but I think we do have a, quite a, a, an issue of how we deal with uh, blatant violations. Before we look at that, however, um, I think we can also look at three questions that really have to do with higher education governance. The first uh, is how institutional leaders are elected or hired and by whom. Um, as I said, there, there has been a development in Europe toward a greater emphasis on hiring institutional leaders than electing them. Um, and uh, when they're hired, it's really, it's the, generally the university governing by the university senate that hires a leader, an institutional leader, rector. Uh, for a period um, where they are elected, it's really by the academic community, either by the governing bodies or by a broader assembly, a representative assembly. And the difference here is, is quite fundamental in the kind of competence that you're looking for in institutional leaders. So I'd be interested, I think, in, in some of your views on how institutional leaders should be identified and who should identify them. The, Second, as I said, in Europe, we have seen a development toward greater external representation and governing body. The, the rationale behind it is that uh, higher education has a mission in regard to broader society. So it's reasonable that um, broader society is also represented in the governing bodies. Um, I think there's little fundamental disagreement about the need 
and the benefit of some external representation in the governing bodies. But I think there are two questions that I'd be interested in hearing your views on. The first is, what is a reasonable external representation? Is it the majority uh, of representatives on the governing bodies? Is it the minority? And if it's a minority, how large or how small a minority? And the second is, who are these external representation? Um, the sectors that are well organized is the labor, the economic uh, sector. So employers and employees. So there has been a certain tendency to say we need the employers organization on board. We need the trade unions, uh, greater trade unions on board. What about other sectors of society? Is there a place for, for example, Amnesty International? for NGOs um, they are active in culture or in um, broad other areas of education, et cetera. So I, I'd be very interested in hearing your views on what, how big an external representation we should have in governing bodies and who these external representatives should, should be. And the third issue is um, quality assurance. Um, we said, that there are two main reasons for why fundamental issues are fundamental values are important. One that's linked to democracy, but the other is that you cannot have a good quality research and teaching without um, observing the fundamental values. At the same time, we see, at least in the European context, that fundamental values are not really an explicit part of um what quality assurance agencies do for the most part they're not uh, fundamental values are not explicitly referenced in the basic standards european standards and guidelines and there has uh, there was a relatively heated discussion in the previous period uh, which was also linked perhaps to a reluctance to review the european standards and guidelines but if we say that um fundamental values are important for the quality of um, teaching, learning, and research, how do we make that link? What role do you think that fundamental values should play in assessing the quality of institutions and programs? So um, then I, I would like to uh raise a couple of other points before we open for discussion um you see very many situations in which the ideals um see or the ideal situation seem relatively easy to describe we all we all agree that we need university autonomy and then when ideals meet reality or maybe ideals meet politics it gets a bit more complicated so I'd like to hear your views on what are significant violations of fundamental values. I think we can all agree that uh, there are many sort of minor violations and not all countries are guilty of them. But why, what, what are, when is a violation significant enough that we need to react? And um, I'm not here thinking not only of um, cases where um, you know, that there is political repression. Um, I talked about the basic principle that <clears throat> public authorities are responsible for the system and institutions for their uh, own operations, their own teaching and research. Um, again, that seems like a relatively straightforward uh, case. But if we say that uh, public authorities have a duty and a right to ensure provision of higher education in all parts of the country, uh, what does that actually mean in, in practice? There is a, a recent case from my home country, again, Norway, where um, there is a decentralized teacher training offer in a relatively small and isolated uh, part of the country called Nesna where the mother institution actually decided to discontinue this study program because it felt um, that it was uh, there, there was no reasonable proportion between the amount of resources put in and the outcome and it also felt that the quality uh, it could not really vouch for the quality of the offer so the um, 
program is closed, uh, then um, this fall, the country got a new government. Part of the platform, at least one of the parties in the government, is to reestablish uh, this program. And so the um, Ministry of Education, responsible for higher education, has now directed the institution to reestablish the program. Is that public authorities acting properly in ensuring um, higher education in um, a part of the country that's otherwise not very well provided with higher education? Or um, is the ministry as the public authority responsible here overstepping its um, prerogatives by directing an institution um, to um, establish a particular study program um, given that the institution had closed it also because it felt uncertain about uh, the um, about the quality of the offer. It's a difficult discussion. I have my views on this, but um, I'd also be interested in, in hearing yours. Another issue, of course, is how can we document violations? We've seen that time and again that uh, when you really get into the nitty gritty of individual cases, it can be extremely difficult um, to uh, know exactly what happened, what information you can trust, etc. Um, I think an experience, the experience is that a government that wants to um, demonstrate it as, that accusations of violations are false are very good at inundating you with information that was very, very difficult to control. And then, of course, the question is, um, what should we do about it? And who are we? In this case, uh, the ministers of the Berlin, do you, do you uh, help them best by engaging or do you help them best by taking measures? So there's no easy answer to this question. Um, and um, as we see also in the case of Belarus, um, you know, knowing what serves uh, those whose fundamental values are violated is not not an easy um, issue. So I thought I'd like to illustrate this by the case of Belarus, um, which is not the only violation of uh, fundamental values that we have in the European higher education area, but it's certainly the most blatant as, um, as of now. Belarus actually applied for accession to the Bologna process three times. In 2005, it never got as far as a formal application because um, Belarus got several messages from leading members of the BFUG saying that you may apply, but you will be turned down. So in the end, it decided not to uh, apply. Prior to the 2012 ministerial conference, uh, Belarus did lodge a formal application, and there is quite a bit of discussion around it, but that discussion became impossible when in the wake of the December 2010 presidential election, um, there was a quite strong repression of um, also of members of the academic community in Belarus, so it was simply impossible, and the Bologna follow-up group decided not to put the application to the ministers and no minister then came to the ministerial conference and said we need um, to consider the application by Belarus. Come 2015, the situation is different. Uh, Belarus was accepted as a member of the European higher education area with a roadmap. The formal justification for the roadmap was that uh, Belarus was the first country to accede to the European higher education area after it had been formally established. So. You remember we talked about the Bologna process resulting in 2010 in the European higher education area <clears throat> and Belarus was the first country um, admitted after 2010. Um, there is of course a, real, a different reality also behind that. I mean, the, the need, it is true that any country admitted now has much less time to implement the Bologna reforms and therefore it's reasonable to follow up through a roadmap which is now also being done with San Marino. But there was of course also a real concern in 2015 about the willingness of Belarus to implement especially issues like the fundamental values. The accession of Belarus was not uncontroversial in 2015. There was quite a lot of discussion. I was among those who favored 
the um, accession of Belarus. And my main reason for saying that is we got very strong messages from uh, parts of the academic community, which are absolutely not aligned with the Lukashenko regime, saying, if you don't let us in now, we'll be cut off from Europe for a long time. And it will be detrimental to us. It will be detrimental uh, to Belarus as a country, and it will not prepare us also adequately for a future once Lukashenko belongs to history. Um, so there is a kind of thought. But then, of course, in August 2020, there was another um, presidential election in Belarus, uh, which almost all outside observers agree was uh, tricked, and that um, the sitting president Lukashenko was in, de facto defeated. Um, but of course, that led to widespread repression also against members of the academic community who were quite active in weekly protests. In November 2020, uh, we had the ministerial conference. It was impossible then to get agreement uh, among ministers on the statement on Belarus, uh, but 26 countries and five consultative members um, signed a, a statement developed by the then co-chairs, the UK and Germany. Uh, some, some countries and uh, consultative members uh, were unable to sign also because um, time is quite short and there is no time to add it. There is not adequate um, time to um, conduct internal consultations. And then um, the BFUG has a system of co chairmanships, revolving co chairmanships. So in each six month period, there are two countries uh, that co chair the BFUG. One is the country that holds the EU presidency, and the other is a non-EU country, and the order of non-EU countries general by um, alphabetical order. That would mean that in fall 2022, Belarus would co-chair the Bologna follow-up group, and therefore also be the external phase of the Bologna process. Many of us felt that would be places in a very difficult situation, and there is an initiative um, taken by the European Students' Union, but also with the support of many others, um, and also um, by some of us who could not necessarily say the same things in public, as we said in private, um, that um, suggested to the BFUG that it suspend the Belarusian co-chairmanship. There was a difficult discussion in the BFUG who actually Few uh, delegations other than Belarus uh, spoke very strongly in favor of maintaining the um, chairmanship, but many uh, countries, several countries um, declared they, they wouldn't vote on the issue. So in the end, there was a fairly clear discussion a decision by the BFUG to suspend the Belarusian chairmanship and come back to that after the 2024 ministerial conference, which of course mean that at that time one would need to reassess whether the situation had improved sufficiently or not. So I think the case of Belarus um, certainly illustrates uh, an obvious case of violations of the fundamental values of the uh, European higher education area, uh, but also uh, the difficulty for an intergovernmental process really to address uh, this issue very clearly. So what I would suggest is that we now, um, I stop the presentation and that we open the floor for comments uh, and questions on the issues and challenges. Uh, you know, how do you see, what do you see are the main challenges to fundamental values of higher education in your own context and what should be done about this? So I'll stop the PowerPoint and, um, I think uh, and it will actually moderate this part of the session. Yeah. Okay. So uh, folks, feel free to drop an asterisk in the chat um, like this, or just raise your hand and we will get to everybody um, in an orderly fashion. Also try to keep your questions concise so that we have uh, time to respond to most as many questions as possible. So I, I will start with Marwan from CSA. Uh, 
Yes, thank, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity. I also uh, want to thank- Could you please turn on your camera so that we see who's speaking, sorry. Okay, yeah. Kind of, um, let me turn it. Or if it takes uh, a lot of time, don't bother, but I just thought it was nice to see the person speak. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Marwan, as you said, from the Commonwealth Student Association. Um, let's see, let, I, I want to thank doc, Dr. Scott for spending, uh, you know, this, the, Dr. Stewart for uh, spending much time, you know, uh, giving us this uh, important uh, lectures. I want to talk uh, in respect to the challenges in Nigeria, most especially regarding the challenges of higher education. We have been having series of um, lack of funding to uh, higher education, which basically led to some of the uh, lecturers, you know, in the universities going for strike, which majorly affect the academic activities of the students, sometimes for seven months, sometimes for nine months, you know, sometimes even a year. And this problem has been existing, for example, from the government and the, from the government side, they will be complaining that um, they have been spending money and then there are no progress in terms of uh, in terms of the, 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 the success from the research, the, the country is not uh, good in making some researches that, that the country will benefit. For example, you can see that many countries made research about the vaccine for COVID, while in Nigeria, you know, there is no university that developed, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, even a research methodology or something that uh, has to do with the vaccine for the COVID. So that is from the government end. And this thing has been affecting the academic performance of the student because whenever the university teachers go for strike for seven months, you may see that it affects in, uh, the calendar. The maximum, uh, you know, yes, uh, the minimum years for a Nigerian to have a degree BSc program in the university is four years, but you will, you know, you will understand that sometimes due to uh, striking issues with the lecturers, you know, uh, a student have to spend five, six years of, you know, uh, having a first degree that is supposed to be completed in four years. Now, um, <clears throat> one of the issues now as a solution to this problem, you know, is that um, having uh, a funding mechanism you know, because I, I have seen that you talk about, um, you know, uh, university, uh, you know, I, I mean, autonomy in the higher education. I think uh, one of the, the most important thing is that to, to, to have that uh, autonomy, which we are lacking in the country, you know, so that the, the, the activities of the higher education in the country can go smoothly without political interference and without, uh, you know, you know, you know uh, having some hitches, you know, uh, from funding from the government. Thank you so much. Maybe we could take on another couple of comments uh, then I can respond more globally. If there are other comments. Sure, uh, if anybody else has any questions or comments in the same line as Marwan, uh, feel free to use your hand or drop an asterisk in the chat. Okay, if not, maybe I can respond to that and then hopefully more comments will come. Um, I think certainly, um, I mean, the, the right to strike is a well-established right. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the point about striking is, of course, to uh, hurt your employer, not to hurt broader society, or in this case, hurt students. So uh, I think it's very problematic if, if a long-term strike um, deprives students of education. Uh, I, I think you would be, um, you know, that would be a, a very difficult uh, situation in, in any country, but to which there is no obvious solution, except I think it demonstrates also the uh, need for dialogue between public authorities and the academic community, which I think actually is an important part of the European higher education area. Your example of COVID vaccination is an interesting one because it illustrates quite a number of issues. Um, we agree that uh, getting uh, a COVID vaccination ready is, is a very high um, public priority. I, mean, I think we also agree that it cannot be done without the cooperation of the research community. Um, I think the, the way that uh, European governments would try to uh, stimulate this is through uh, 
by earmarking funding for research and possibly competitive funding, although in this case, of course, uh, time is of the essence. So the um, time to carry out a, a sort of open call for research projects is very limited. Um, I'm not aware of any examples of universities being forced to accept this, but I think there was a very general uh, understanding in the academic communities in most European countries that to the extent that um, the research community could contribute, they should. Uh, there's perhaps a broader issue of um, at the expense of what priorities, um, but this is an emergency situation. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Uh, um, Evans, you're next. Um, Evan, if you can hear me, uh, it's your turn to ask the question. Feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask or comment. Oh, I think we've lost time. But, um, <laughs> and while we wait for him to reconnect, um, Emily, go on. Thank you. I'm from uh, the National Union of Students in Norway. Uh, thank you for a really interesting uh, lecture today, Shur. And I think it's interesting you bring up Ness now, which is something that, is, that you said is being discussed a lot in Norway at the moment. So just thank you for all your thoughts on that and Belarus. Both of these things are, all of these things that we're talking about today are things that we are working on in NSO. And I mean, personally, I don't agree with the reopening of Nesna for the, the reasons you mentioned, the fact that, you know, the government has gone in and um, gone into the institutional autonomy, even though you know we said the the board there said there was not good enough quality and there was not good enough services for the students, and it wasn't a good study environment. So it's be interesting to see what the Norwegian government does moving forward and what how these things progress in Norway with. Uh, the new the new government and what what the next steps would be and that's something around this um, decentralization that we're really working on at the moment to figure out okay well how where do we stand on this as as students and how do we uh, relate to it so but just wanted to say thank you for your time thank you very much uh, emily and um well as, as you as you probably guess from what I said, I'm pretty much on, on, on the same line as you in this case. Um, it is an interesting case, and I think it will be highlighted internationally, because to, to some extent, you can see why the government acts as it does. Uh, I mean, they, wanting to provide higher education outlying parts of the country is, uh, is, is a value, you know, it's a legitimate objective. I think where I have a problem with this case is decoupling that decision from a quality assessment. I think I, I find it very problematic if a public authority overrules the quality assessment. Um, and uh, if there had been sort of a formal quality assessment uh, from the uh, quality assurance agency, and I'm actually not sure whether there has been in this case, whether NUKIT has formally assessed the, the quality of the program or not, but if there had been, um, I think it, it, it was definitely be out of place that the government say we don't care about the uh, outcome of the quality assessments, we go ahead anyway. Um, and, and there was at least the assessment of the uh, university board here saying we cannot justify the quality of this. And as you say, obviously the point about student services is also an important one. So I'd, I'd be interested, I'm interested in, in following how this will develop and of course also interested in seeing um, NSO's position in the end. And I can understand that for the NSO, it is not an easy uh, case in which to take a position. Thank you. And uh, if, if uh, Evans has gotten back to us. Um, yes. So I see Evans is back in the room. Evans, would you like you to ask your question now? Um, uh, are you able to hear us? Um, while we wait for everyone to get back to us, if there are any other questions or uh, comments, 
feel free to uh, unmute yourselves or drop a star in the chat or raise your hands. Okay, yes, hello. Come on. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I'm sure can. Yes. Okay, I just want to to give thanks to Global Student Forum for organizing such event. It was a great uh, event. I've learned so many things. Uh, for me, I, I just have a comment, not a question. I I, I, I recommend uh, the session because it has uh, impacted me and uh, changed how I think about leadership and how I can uh, come up with solutions affecting us as students or as, as youth. So thank you very much for organizing this event. That's the comment. Thank you. Uh, glad you liked the session and we'll continue to try to do this work. If anybody else has questions or comments, feel free to unmute yourselves, drop a star in the chat or raise your hand. Or if not, maybe we'll have some more comments uh, after we look at student representation. So if you agree, um, and if there are no other comments, maybe we can uh, continue with that. I would just ask for a small, to give me a small technical break. I'm at an age now where um, the prostate also operates. So I just need to disappear for three minutes, if you allow, and maybe you'll have some more comments in the meantime. So I'll uh, close my camera and come back. I'm good, sir. Um, in the meantime, uh, folks, uh, well, you're welcome to think about any questions you may have or any uh, comments that you would want to bring up to uh, us here. Um, yeah, alternatively, it's also a good time to think about some of the prompts that he had posted in, in the uh, presentation. Perhaps uh, we can have a discussion about uh, student representation on your campus uh, decision making bodies or whether uh, recognition is something that you are afforded in your national context or your regional context and certain other things, which uh, I'm sure you would have very good insights on. Well, what I'll do then is I'll, I'll continue. I'll then go back to sharing my screen and I'll rely on your help and seeing if there are any comments or questions. So. Sounds good. Okay, so um, I'll just look briefly at the role of student representatives and of course uh, you're much more competent than I am um, to talk about your own role, but um, it may nevertheless be useful just to spend a little bit of time reflecting on it instead of course. Um, student representation that we discussed is, is, is at different levels ranging from uh, department level through faculty institution and then at the system level where it's more likely to be a consultation rather than a formal body, although I know that some rectors conference, for example, also have a seat for for, for the student union. Um, and there's, of course, a point that um, in any system, it should be possible to establish a student union freely and fairly. And then uh, so the European higher education area uh, and, and I think the um, this this forum is also an example of the importance of um, the continent-wide uh, student organization. Um, to what extent uh, is there in, in your different context a link between the student unions and the representation and governance bodies? Are, they, uh, are the representatives identified through the student unions or uh, are they rather, uh, which should probably be the common uh, situation, um, um, the student representatives are direct, uh, elected directly to the governing bodies and student unions may of course run their own representatives. That does raise the question about the free and fair elections, which should be a requirement we've seen in, in, in a number of countries, uh, including but not limited to Belarus. Um, that uh, there are official and non-official student organizations and uh, the European Student Union has done very good work with, uh, in relation to Belarus uh, by encouraging um, those um, student organizations uh, that are not uh, run by the regime. And that's, of course, a very important uh, work that you're doing there. The other question, of course, is how representative 
uh, are student representatives. Um, so there may be an issue, and, and you'll tell me to what extent this is true in your own context, of a disengagement by students, um, as we have in societies more broadly sometimes, and a discussion of disengage, uh, an issue of disengagement. How do you encourage students to participate in the work of the student unions? And how do you actually encourage students to vote? Um, you know, when I was a student representative, as I say, very long time ago in the early 1980s, we did have a, an issue of, uh, in some uh, departments, um, very low participation so that you had two representatives and the department council elected perhaps by 12 or 15 students out of 100. And so um, how do you as student unions work to um, get your fellow students to commit to um, the uh, to participating? It's really an issue of developing a culture of committing to public space, which is important for our democracy, it's important for cultural democracy, it's important for a student representation. Um, as student representatives, you are, of course, voices for conscience, and I think we've seen that uh, in, in many discussions in the European higher education area, and not least when it comes to the um, to Belarus, but you are also, in a sense, power brokers. You are a part of the governing system and it's important that you engage uh, and participate there. And I think in, in the European higher education area, I'm not sure if SS representatives would agree with my assessment, but I think actually that SU has an influence by engaging and by the competence of its representative um, that is much more than a single voice among the consultative members. Of course, you do need to present the student points of views, but you will do that more efficiently if you engage in the whole range of issues before the governing body, because then you're not seen as merely a sectoral representative. You are seen as somebody who um, takes responsibility for the development of the department or the faculty of the institution or of the um, of the system. So uh, I think it's, it's very important that you as student representatives engage in the full range of issues before you. That, of course, combining all these different elements as voices of conscience, the student points of view, responsibility for the system also means that I would hope that student representatives would be active advocates of the fundamental values. That said, of course, in some systems, that's easier than in other systems. And I would be interested in hearing from you what you see the main challenging is uh, being in advocating the fundamental values and how you put them into practice in your own work. I'm sure that there might be a bit of discussion around this. Um, I would nevertheless suggest that uh, maybe I just go through relatively briefly some of the texts and initiatives. And again, I apologize for this being mainly a, a European uh, view of the world, but okay, that's where I come from. So the fundamental text in Europe, in a sense, is the Magna Carta Universitatum, which uh, is from 1988. Um, I put in hyperlinks here, um, and um, I'd be very happy for my PowerPoint uh, presentation to be distributed to uh, participants so you don't have to uh, write down frantically. The Magna Carta Universitatum is um, adopted in 1988, and it is an important uh, statement. It is also a fairly general statement. Um, and the um, Magna, it is overseen by uh, the Magna Carta Observatory, which is based at the University of Bologna. Um, and it updated uh, the Magna Carta Universitatum um, by guess what, the Magna Carta Universitatum 2020. Now, it was actually not presented until 2021, and you can guess why, obviously, because of COVID. And it is, in a sense, uh, a further development or an update of the Magna Carta Universitatum. As I said, it, uh, it focuses fairly strongly on autonomy, 
but um, there is also something about um, academic freedom. Um, the autonomy is also, uh huh. I think maybe. Oh, okay, I think I got my slides a bit. Okay, um, so we're talking about the European higher education area. Of course, the main uh, source, um, the, the policy documents in the uh, European higher education area are the ministerial communi communiques, uh, the Bologna Declaration, and the following communiques. The um, ministers adopt to communicate every time they meet. I said in the beginning, every two years, later three to four years, the next ministerial conference will not be until April, uh, until May, June 2024. Um, and you will find here a link to all the communiques uh, through a single link at the, uh, at the EHA webpage, where you will actually also find the background materials for the different ministerial conferences. It really is a wealth of information. Um, not always easy to find your way around, uh, but worth spending some time looking at it. Uh, so in particular, there is uh, the definition of academic freedom for November 2022, so I've included a direct link to that. Uh, I also have it on, on, on my slide. Um, and there is an often overlooked document, which is very well hidden, um, which is a 2004 <coughs> BFUG document on further accessions to the Bologna process. The reason uh, this is um, of interest in our context is that it very clearly specifies that there is a set of values um, uh, to which members are expected to commit, and that do include academic freedom, institutional autonomy, and also student and staff participation in higher education uh, governance. OK, so now we got to the slide I thought I got to um, a minute ago. Um, the uh, European University Association has developed the University Autonomy Scorecard. And that, as you would expect, uh, your, your university organization part, uh, focus in particular on um, autonomy. Uh, and it assesses, according to several dimensions, how um, universities fare on this. So it's really also a wealth of information. Um, scholars at risk, as I said, uh, has a double purpose it protects and tries to find. Uh, solutions for uh, scholars that have to flee their own countries or institutions because of persecution. And it is also a strong voice for um, in, for academic freedom. So uh, definitely one of the NGOs that I think is important to listen to. Um, I apologize for spending some time um, trumping our own. Um, initiatives. The Council of Europe is, is an intergovernmental organization in Europe. We have 47 members, but in the um, area of education and culture, we actually have 50 countries through the European Cultural Convention. Um, we uh, did quite some work on the notion of public responsibility following the um, two uh, Bologna communiques that I referred to earlier from 2001 to 2003. And you'll find the result in the 2007 recommendation on the public responsibility for higher education and research. I, I, again, it's, it's a European uh, recommendation, but I think it might be worth your while looking at it. So we also talk about, um, as I said, the um, different degrees of responsibility. This is also where we outline what we see as the major purposes of um, higher education. The background for that is if you look at uh, the public debate in Europe in the early 2000s, it was very strongly focused on the role of higher education in preparing for the labor market, which of course is very important. So what we're saying is not that um, higher education does not and should not play an important part in um, preparing for the labor market. What we are saying is that is not the only function of higher education. So we define the um, main purpose of higher education as um, the preparation for the labor market, but also preparation for life as active citizens in democratic societies, 
as uh, furthering personal development and as societies uh, we need a broad and advanced knowledge base uh, mainly that's research uh, but of course if you think about vocational education it's also uh, advanced vocational education these purposes are not contradictory they complement each other many of the competences that make you attractive on the labor market will also make you very well um, placed to, uh, to uh, participate in uh, public uh, debate and public life um, and uh, of course they will um, further your um, uh, further your personal development so it's really um, an incentive um, for public authorities to recognize the different purposes of higher education they're listed not in an order of importance we consider them <coughs> equally important but rather more in the order in which they appear in public debate and then we have a, a different recommendation on the responsibility of public authorities for academic freedom and institutional autonomy. There is a paradox here because um, largely um, these two fundamental values to some extent depend on um, public authorities abstaining from exercising their um, a very active role, but of course uh, the framework conditions are important. And at least um, we have this cooperation with uh, a group of U.S. Uh, higher education NGOs, uh, the International Association of Universities, and the Organization of American State. Um, essentially, every two to three years, we have what we call a global forum, which addresses an aspect of the democratic mission of higher education. In nine, 2019, um, we addressed academic uh, freedom, institutional autonomy, and the future of democracy. Um, and I hope that the link, uh, that the declaration is also worth while. Um, we also run some uh, projects, as I said, the Democratic Mission of Higher Education, um, what we call the Ethernet platform, which is um, a platform to promote ethics, transparency, and integrity in education, and of course also to uh, then counter plagiarism, um, falsification, and uh, corruption. And not least, um, we have what we call the European Qualifications Passport for Refugees. Um, one of the many obstacles that refugees face is that um, they cannot always document the qualifications they have. And um, a classical credentials evaluator will want to see documentation. So uh, with the, in cooperation with several of our um, member countries, we have developed a methodology and a format for assessing qualifications when they cannot be adequately documented uh, means that qualified credentials evaluators from two countries um, interview um, the candidate uh, also look at whatever documentation is available one of the at least one of the credentials evaluators will have specialized knowledge of the education system from which the qualifications come and um, also um, language um, and if the candidate um, passes muster, he or she will get uh, the EQPR, which is a form, uh, a, a document outlining the methodology and also outlining um, the qualifications that the credentials evaluator considered very likely that the candidate will have. It's not as good as a uh, as a, a recognition decision. But it is a lot better than the alternative, which would be to start from scratch. So the, on the one hand, it's a methodology for assessment. On the other hand, it's a format for describing that assessment in such a way that uh, if and when the refugees move within the European region, uh, they shouldn't have to go through this process all over again. And we currently have 13 countries, as well as the United uh, Nations High Commission for Refugees uh, involved in the project. And these are simply my um, contact data. Um, I will uh, retire from the Council of Europe at the end of this month. My Council of Europe address will probably be uh, active for some time after that, but also I give you my Gmail address in case um, you would want to make contact. And as I said, be very happy for this presentation to be shared with participants. I understand also that um, the um, session will be uh, available through recording.